Hey everyone, it's me, Steve. It's August 4th, 2020, and the only reason why I'm telling you that is because it's 69 degrees out right now, which is 20, 21 degrees centigrade, something like that. Yeah, somewhere in there. And it's nice out. This is really as cool as it's been in a long time in August, but that's weird because two weeks ago, <laughs> we had August weather, and now we're having October weather. But you know what? I'll take it. Anyway before I digress too long. What are we talking about today? Well, I'm going to talk about what is a rock. How do geologists define what a rock is? Now, this is going to be a bit dry. It is going to involve a lot of definitions because like most professions and, and technical stuff, we use a lot of everyday words to mean other things. This happens all the time, even in non-technical settings. We'll take everyday words or words that we give technical meanings to, put them together and give them a new meaning altogether. You now, where the words in and of themselves have lost their total original lay meaning. What is a rock? Well, this is the definition accepted by most geologists. This is from the USGS the United States Geological Survey. This is their definition, and it is pretty much the accepted definition. I wouldn't change this at all. I am for this. Now, this definition contains a lot of other words within it, and we will get to these, and you, you may be thinking, looking at them, be like, oh, yeah, it's an aggregate of one or more minerals or body undifferentiated mineral matter. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. So that means a rock can be you know, a rock can be something that I hold in my hand. This is a rock, all right? It's an aggregate of one or more minerals. It's not undifferentiated mineral matter. We'll get to that. But that's an or, a, not and. You can exclude that part. That's what or means. Anyway, so this is a rock, okay? So is this. Be like, Steve! That's sand though, sand's not a rock. In geology, we do not differentiate. And this is the only time you're gonna hear me tie it into uh, stratigraphy or something like that. Uh, because a rock does not have to be indurated to a certain degree to be a rock. It's a rock, this is a rock too. I mean, it was, I physically broke this down from a sandstone, but this is what it originally was before it was a sandstone. But this is still a rock, and it, we were defining it as a formal unit. In this case, it is in Wisconsin. It's a member of the Wanawak Formation. It's Cambrian. It's a Galesville member. If this was unindurated like this, would we still give it a formal name? Yeah. We treat these the same way as we do what most people consider rocks. Okay, so as you can see, the professional definitions are already varying a little bit in concept from the lay definition of what a rock is. But would you like to know what the actual geologic technical term for a rock is? It's rock. I'm not even gonna <laughs> I'm not even gonna lead you on, on that one. A rock is a rock and you might be thinking, well, why haven't geologists come up with a better name to attach this definition to it, to kind of separate it from layman speak? Because this happens all the time in science. It, this is nothing unusual. We will take lay terms and apply them and give them a technical meaning. I've already said that. So I do have a couple slides I'm going to show you and stuff like that, but it's not going to be mostly slides. It's going to be me mostly talking to you. I will have some nice cute little backgrounds for you and whatnot just to try to keep your interest because quite honestly this bores me too but it is necessary let's break this apart a little bit let's take this one step at a time in order to be a rock you have to be this but each of these things also have their own meanings i'm not going to talk about aggregate because that means what it does in lay speak there's no special meaning to that Aggregate of one or more minerals. We'll, we'll assume for the sake of argument, these are one mineral, okay? If they get compressed together like this, just like this, 
they're a rock now. Or they're this, because it's one or more. So this would also be a new rock. Or, or this would be a new rock, but so is this. It means a jumbling or a mixture of either homogeneous or heterogeneous material, essentially. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all I'm going to say about aggregate. We know that one is one or more greater than one, so it's either so it's either one or greater than one, but you have to have at least one. You have to have one or more mineral. This is where people, it's going to vary from everyday speak and some people don't understand this part. So we're going to spend a little time on this. Just real quick. This is how the USGS defines a mineral. The definition I was taught in college is slightly different from this, but this is good enough. A mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic element or compound having an orderly internal structure and characteristic chemical composition, crystal form, and physical properties. And then it gives some common minerals, but you know, I talk about those all the time. So basically, it, a, a mineral has to have crystals, okay? It's made of crystals. Now we have something called a mineraloid, which I'm gonna to talk to, and that's what this or a body is partially for. So you have to have crystals. Crystals are solids, just like the mantle is. Liquids do not have crystal properties to them. This is something for solids. Liquids are, in geology we consider them, chemical concoctions, okay? So minerals are made of crystals, which are always solids. All right, and we're going to come back to this because this is important. When we start talking about molten rock, which confuses people. But we'll get back to that. We're going to get into some gray areas as to what constitutes a mineral here a little bit. Now... According to the USGS and the accepted definition, a mineral has to be inorganic. Well, we consider carbonates minerals. You know, calcite, dolomite, those kind of things. Well, you might sit there and say, yeah, they are minerals. And we accept them as minerals. They're an exception to the rule, okay? Although not for the reasons given in this. This sits there and says there's, there are also minerals that's formed by inorganic and organic processes. In geology, it's not applicable. We don't identify minerals based on how they form origin of deposition or environment of deposition. Things like calcite and dolomite do form crystals that fit the mineral definition except the part about being organic, and we'll come to that, regardless if they were in part of an animal's shell or foreign from a carbonite magma. And what you see here is a chunk of carbonite that I have. This rock crystallized out of a magma. It wasn't deposited chemically in a sea, nor was it deposited by a bunch of dead things. It came from up inside the earth. These things are rare, but they do exist. So, so, along the same line, however, I guess you could argue that since carbonates contain carbon, they are all organic chemicals or solids, whatever chemistry doesn't differentiate between states of matter. We exclude all organic chemicals from a definition of a mineral, although some do form crystals. There are organic compounds that form crystals, but those are talks for other times. And this will come back to bite us in the backside again later when we're talking about coal. So why is this? Why is carbonate an exception? Or carbonate minerals, I would say. Honestly, it's a hangover from the 18th century. Naturalists were already naturalists or what we used to call geologists and biologists and stuff like that before we had an actual terms assigned to them. Naturalists were already out in the field attempting to decipher the history of the earth through the rocks long before we defined even what 
atoms were, even before the building blocks of what a calcite was, what a dolomite was, or any of that stuff. They looked at natural, non-living, and non-fossilized earth materials as rocks. That's what naturalists pictured as rocks being. So they would be out in the field if it wasn't a fossil, or if it wasn't living at one point, or presently living, it was rock. All right? That, that's what they did. James Hutton, the father of modern geology, was already 100 years buried by the time the electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson in 1897. So you see, the, it, then geology as a science started to move forward a little quicker than chemistry did. Why is that? Well, because it's real easy to go out in the field and pick up something like this. All right? It's a lot harder to identify the actual basic, we're not going to talk about quarks or any of that stuff, but, or quantum anything, but the basic building blocks of this require technical tools that had not been invented at the time. These have been around for a long time. Well, not my eyes in particular, but I mean eyes in general have been around for millions and millions of years. So it's no surprise that geology had a little bit of a head start on chemistry. I'm using the American Chemical Society's definition of what organic chemistry is. Basically, it's carbon-based chemistry. In a nutshell, you can read through it yourself. That's why you could argue you could possibly pull carbonates out of this. But like I said, there's the long-standing tradition that they are included in natural earth materials. And some of them, and you know, even though they are chemical or biological, they can also, in special cases, be clastic. And they can be igneous rocks as well. We treat them as we would any other rock. All right, so we've talked about that. So we have already established that minerals, what minerals are based on their definition, they have to be solids. So let's go to the next logical one. What is a solid? The generic definition of a solid is a substance or object that is not liquid or gas. I pulled that off the internet off of, I forget which dictionary it was, the Oxford I think it was. All right, we're going to go a little deeper than that. The scientific definition is given by Anne Helmstein, who's a PhD, is the state of matter characterized by particles arranged such that their shape and volume are relatively stable. I hope that makes sense, okay? I would, however, add a little bit of geotechnical bit to this. I would add to that definition and can serve as a medium for the propagation of shear waves or S waves in seismology. And I've done a whole lecture on seismology, so I'm not going to do it again. So that is what a solid is. These things are not solids. Magma and lava are not solids. I'm talking about the liquid versions of these. Magma, this is where things get a little hairy, and if you're not in the field of geology and don't study geology, I can see where you can get tripped up. Magma, no one argues magma is a solid, all right? This is basically the surface version of this. Magma is a melt. It is a liquid. It's in liquid state. Shear waves will not pass through it. So it cannot be a mineral. Thus, it cannot be a rock, all right? Now, magma if it comes up on the surface, becomes lava. Now, lava can harden into, guess what? Lava! <laughs> Which is a solid. See how this gets a little bit... <laughs> if you don't know. All right. So I understand the confusions. So what is a lava? All right. I've already talked to you about what it is a little bit. I'm going to give you the USGS's 2015 definition. Lava is a general term for a magma that has erupted onto the surface of Earth and maintains its fluid or viscous mass rather than exploding into rock fragments. That doesn't have to, that has nothing to do with the gases associated with explosive eruptions or anything like that. Think of Hawaii's eruptions when I'm talking about lava. And we refer to 
hard lavas, if you will, solid lavas as lava. All right? So, <laughs> like the unnamed largest single lava flow on the planet isn't in liquid form. It's in solid form. It's in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. No one has ever given it a formal name. It's just informally known as the Green Flow. It's not that far north from our cabin. goes under Lake Superior. comes out on Isle Royale. We refer to that as a lava flow, but it's not liquid. Ugh, right? I get it. I understand. So is there a term used to differentiate between liquid and solid lava? Yes, there is. You may have seen this term before, molten rock. Well, Steve, you just told me that in order to be a rock, you have to be a mineral, which by definition is a solid. Yeah. Okay, so rocks are solid. So what's up with this molten rock? This is one of those things where putting two words together, molten, a, you know, a physical state, and a noun rock together does not mean the rock, it's a rock in liquid form. It does not mean that any more than a lazy Susan is a su person named Susan who is lazy. Okay, we do this all the time. You know, a automobile records are not vinyl 45s sitting in your car. You don't think that when people say that. Okay, if you buy a piece of property and you get a warranty deed, that doesn't mean your land is under warranty like your refrigerator is for a year after you purchase it. What it basically does is guarantee it's all free of legal liabilities like liens and mortgages and other things as such. That's what that means. Just like Mr. Potato Head is not a person potato, nor does he even have a head. Heads are parts of bodies. They are not the body, as in the case of Mr. Potato Head. So you can't necessarily logically deduce what a phrase means from the words in that phrase. I just want to make that clear and show you examples. And where does this come from? Well, this part's where we get a little tricky, all right, because Molten rock, before I tell you what it actually is, because it's because I'm going to give you a little bit of history about it, comes from an old term that's not really used anymore, molten lava. Remember I said sol uh, lava could be a solid or liquid? Well, generally, as lava flows were defined as solids when, they, when we first started studying these things, in order to differentiate them, put flat molten in front of them. Okay, that's what an old professor told me, and he was one of the guys who, he's still alive, man, he's got to be late 80s now, he's got to be my grandparents' age, or my grandparents' actually early 90s, but he was around during what we call the Granite Wars, <laughs> and this is a talk for another time, but I just want to talk about it really quickly. The Granite Wars, for a long time we didn't know if granites were igneous or metamorphic, now it's largely accepted that they're igneous of origin, but that was not decided until a certain paper came out, which I have an original copy of in 1958 okay this is what put the great granite debate to rest and it was a triumph of the scientific method over arguing all right this gets you answers talking about stuff gets you talking about stuff all right also a rant for another time so as time went on, this was basically forgotten. By the way, you'd be hard pressed to find this in a scientific paper at all. Okay, molten rock is some, a term we use. You'll see it in textbooks and stuff like that. And USGS talks about it, stuff like that. But it's not really a technical term. So you don't see it in papers. It is a legitimate term. It's not like when young earth creationists take geologic time scale drop the time scale and take stratigraphic column, drop the stratigraphic, put them together, geologic co column, to, to force a narrative. All right? Geologists don't use the term geologic column. Those are related terms, but they do not synonyms. All right? I've talked about that before. So this, this came about as a way to differentiate between liquid and solid lavas. Well, what actually is molten rock? Molten rock, okay, 
is generally a lay term, although we do use it. It's a rock that has been melted that is either on the surface, lava, or in the subsurface, magma. It kills both birds with one stone because quite honestly, there is no chem a magma. This is your surface of your earth right here, okay? We'll use red. You get a magma that starts coming up. Remember, underground, this is cross section, no scale, just for demonstration purposes. Your magma, because it's underground, is coming up, coming up, still a magma, still a magma, up, oh, spills up onto the surface, now it's a lava. Chemically, it's exactly the same here, it has no chemical difference than it did here. The only difference might maybe is it took some of the surface rock to reincorporate it as, at the base. But, you know, it also passed through it. So chemically, it's the same thing. So by saying molten rock, we don't have to sub-differentiate between a long, long-standing and admittedly something that should have died decades ago. Personally, I think the word lava should be used to refer to solid lava flows that you can map, okay? You know, because they are formal stratigraphic units, the North American Stratigraphic Code. I said I wasn't going to do this and I'm doing it. <laughs> Talking about the stratigraphic code and stratigraphy sits there and you can formalize lava flows. There's an entire section on that. I think we should, you know, define lavas as solids, magmas as liquid, and maybe change molten rock because it can be misleading to just calling it a melt. Because that's what it is. Instead of calling it magma or lava if it's in liquid form, get rid of magma. I mean, it's still useful, I guess. I guess we could use it. And just describing the melt. You will see this in scientific papers a lot. Especially ones talking about plutonically placed igneous rocks. So can I demonstrate this a little better for you to show the importance and relevance between a solid and a liquid and why liquids are not considered rock? Well, yes. I have two things here. I have ice cubes, water ice, another term that you can't necessarily guess what it means just by the two words because other compounds can form ices, but this is water ice. You can see this is a solid by the very definition. It's retaining its shape, it's relatively stable. By the way, the temperature point of where something becomes a solid has nothing to do with whether or not it is a mineral, all right? It just, like, I'm. these are presently in solid form and I am talking about them, these are minerals. And according to the USGS and other sources, and I've always been taught, ice is a mineral. Now, these are forced shapes, all right? And this particular one, I guess, technically wouldn't be called a mineral because I formed it in my refrigerator and it's actually a mineraloid, which I'm gonna talk about. But for argument's sake, we'll say I found this outside, you know, during the snowstorm, but that's kind of ha hard to happen when it's 20 degrees Celsius out and August. Okay, so for the sake of argument, these are a mineral. Like I said, if this was naturally occurring, it would be. They form hexagonal crystals. There are six, well, you can tell my age because six crystal systems. Uh, some people use seven that every mineral falls under. Every single mineral is one of those six or seven, depending on how you look at it. And this is hexagonal. Quartz is also hexagonal, so is calcite. Okay? This is not a mineral. This could be thought of as the melt. Oh, I erased it. I had melt up here, because this is not a mineral. This is not ice. All right? I'm using an everyday example here for you guys as the melt or magma, I guess, technically lava because it's on the surface unless I do this, I guess. I don't really know. So it's a melt. And that's another thing. The temperature of a melt has nothing to do with whether it is a melt or not. It is a physical state of matter that matters. Wow, I didn't even plan that lousy, that lousy pun. These are rocks. If they were natural, they would be rocks. They fit the definition. It's an aggregate of one, ice, water ice, 
or more, well, just one water ice mineral, which we've already talked about. Ice will form hexagonal crystals. That's why snowflakes have six sides. Or a body of undifferentiated mineral matter. This is going to take us into the mineraloid. All right. What is a mineraloid? It's a naturally occurring mineral-like substance that does not definite crystal structures. So basically, it has all the properties of being a mineral. It fits the definition of being a mineral, except it doesn't, doesn't form crystals. But it is in a solid state. That's where this or a body of undifferentiated mineral matter comes in. And it also covers our butt on something else that I mentioned earlier that was going to come back to bite us there. All right. But there are examples. I mean, mineraloids, you're actually pretty familiar with them. Here are some well-known mineraloids. Obsidian is a volcanic glass. Under certain conditions, if it would have cooled a lot slower, deeper in the ground, maybe it would have formed quartz. Probably a gabbro, but it didn't. Okay. Limonite. Limonite are, is just a generic term for a bunch of iron oxides that kind of color a rocky yellow. They don't form crystals. You get these weird mixtures, weird compounds. It's a generic term. So it doesn't really form crystals. It appears more of a yellow, as a yellow powder. And I don't, and don't think of sulfur. It's not that yellow, but it, it's yellow. And opal, which is just hydrated silica, hydrated SiO2. All right, so those are some common mineraloids. Just the mineraloid and coal are the only two exceptions I'm going to talk about in this case. And this another way how we force coal into this definition, we can also kind of force some carbonates into it automatically that way as well. Uh, so <laughs> that helps, uh, especially our gelaceous ones or sandy ones, ones with a lot of clastics in them, or their clastic deposits themselves derived from muds. But anyway, we've talked about lava, magma, Molten rock, melt, and you're going to see this. I want to touch on this because I don't think it will be long enough to warrant its own lecture, but I think it's important. It's another one, and it fits in. You know, one of those things where if you don't know what it is and you hear someone say it, you might sit there and think you've got an I gotcha, but you just don't know what you're talking about because you're not well versed in the terminology. You don't have the experience using it. One of those is granitoid versus granites. Well, what's a granitoid or granitic is another one. Let's use granitic instead of granitoid. Uh, granitoid is a rock that at first appearance looks granitic without any study. All right, this is a granitoid. All right, I still have yet to analyze it. It's been sitting here for weeks. Probably is a granite, but I don't know because I haven't plotted it. So we're going to talk about granitic versus granite because I think it's easier to understand. People are more familiar with this. Granitic, you might sit there and hear people say, they hear geologists say, that rock is granitic. Okay? And it's kind of, these two are almost synonyms. All right? But that doesn't mean that it is a granite. Depending on how you classify a granite, and until you do your quartz case bar or alkali feldspar, your QAP plagioclase count, you won't know for sure if it's a granite. I've showed you the QAPF diagram before. Here it is again, just to show you. So a granite is an actual name attached to a rock to describe its chemical makeup in a very general way. If I tell you something is a granite, I can get a lot of information out of it just from that word. Granite, well, it's phaneritic, probably of plutonic origin, but we don't classify rocks based on origin. It is roughly coarse crystalline, you know, we'll go back to this for a little bit. All right, I can see a lot of the individual minerals with my eyes. It's not microscopic, okay? I can even get a little bit out of its chemistry. I know it has at least 20% quartz in it. I know it has at least a significant amount of case bar in it or alkali feldspar to pull it away from that TTG part of the diagram, the tonalites, the granodiorites, those things. Okay, so I can tell a lot by you just telling me something's a granite. It still leaves a lot of unanswered questions, but this forms a solid picture in a geologist's mind. This may not. Granitic can mean I'm talking about a granite, but it doesn't have to be. It, it could mean texturally. 
It means I have large identify or large pronounced, I shouldn't say readily identifiable, but large pronounced crystals in an igneous rock. It doesn't have to be plutonic. Actually, it doesn't even have to really be igneous. There's a lot of terms like in everyday language that as time goes on, they switch meaning. Some hang around. Arcos in sandstones, I've talked about sandstones, is a perfect example of this. Right? But that's a talk for another time. And we still use Arcos, but it means something totally different than it used to. Granitic just means you look like a granite. Your texture, your grain size. It's mostly a textural grain size thing. Crystals. Like this here. This, I've talked about this before. I actually did an analysis on it. And you see nausea there. All right. This I purchased because of, probably can't see it very well. I'll take a picture of it so you can. These reddish colors, these big crystals. This is one of my Uper lights. It does fluoresce under long wave UV, but it looks nothing like the typical ones. And that's what made me buy it. The red mineral is common in igneous, feldspathoid, void rich, phaneritic, coarse grained igneous rocks. But it is not common in the continental US. It does happen a little bit in the Coldwell complex, but up in Greenland, where we're going to go next year, so maybe we can get in, this exists in outcrop. It is possible that this is an actual piece of nogite that was transported by the glaciers from southwest Greenland all the way to the Cubanal Peninsula on the west side on the shore. And most of the eupolites aren't from that, they're from the northeast corner. I've talked about this of Lake Superior in the Coldwell Complex. This rock is in no way, shape, or form a granite. And granites, by definition, do not have voids in them. I've talked about this before. But the texture is granitic. Other than that, if I didn't have a UV light and I just saw this sitting at a distance, I might call it a granite. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a granite. But if I was to be more genuine about it, I wouldn't sit there and look at that from a distance if I the first time I was looking, was looking at it and go, oh yeah, that's a granite. I'd be like, that's a granitic rock. I've actually run into people uh, confusing these two. So I just thought I'd clear it up since it seems to be really common. So is that rock from Greenland? Maybe. I'll be able to tell more in depth and more accurately once we go to Greenland and look at the actual nodites and outcrop and do counts on them to see where they fit on the QAPF diagram. Actually, the FAP or FAP part, the FOID, alkali feldspar or case bar and plagioclase part. So I just thought I would include that here for you. And I think that's it. I hope I covered everything and I really wanted to make that clear. The point of this video wasn't to dog anyone. It wasn't to sit there and demean anyone. I just wish professionals would make more videos like this because a lot of times the average person, even if they're well versed into it, and this is why kind of one of those things like formal education matters because you can be formally educated. Uh, you know, someone who's been studying geology for 50 years can sit there and tell you the difference between granitic and granite like that, you know, as opposed to where if you have to look it up and you might say, oh, those are similar words, they're probably synonyms and just move on. So there are advantages of formal education, but I digress. Professionals really need to make stuff like this to let the public know about the technical terms. Because, yeah, it's boring. Yeah, it's dry. I mean, when I was in college, I loved geology. I wanted to do the structural geology. I wanted to do the geophysics. I wanted to do the stratigraphy. I didn't want to sit there and learn stuff like, ah, uh, this, boring definitions. But as I have grown upon the years, and I see myself as growing, I hope everyone else does too, uh, I have learned that a lot of people don't understand, and it's really no fault of theirs. Like, something like this, I would never, if, if, you, if you sat there and used the word granitic instead of granite, and I know you aren't a geologist, I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, you're an idiot for not knowing the difference. I might sit there and say, you mean granite or something. I might correct you, but I'm not going to dog you about it. That doesn't help anyone, and doesn't help anyone learn, and it doesn't help peripherate knowledge. I will be doing probably more of these in geophiles, and geophiles are meant to be more technical anyway, and longer. So anyway, 
I guess that's it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and I hope you learned something.